friend, you know what that means. Let me explain with Chris Vecchio. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Have I missed you guys? Did you really? I... I missed you, Chris. I wasn't here last week, but we're back now with a vengeance and feeling Do you, do good. you notice anything different about this picture, Chris? Do you... Well, I, I see you, and then I see this man who looks like Tom Sosna, but I don't see a beret, so that couldn't possibly be him. It needs to be stretched out first. Wilson! Oh, there we Wilson! go. <laughs> it's, we're working on it, Chris. It'll be ready to, be ready to day so. <laughs> I, I've heard of putting like your baseball mitt in the oven, but <laughs> your beret on a basketball. That's, that's how right. we do it here, dude. That's how we do it. Uh-huh. <sighs> good to see that you guys had a good vacation. You missed uh, you missed an interesting week in markets. I have mm -hmm. to wonder if perhaps you guys being gone and a potential mutiny in Russia had anything to do with one another. But I'll leave that to the sleuths online to figure out. Last week you had you had movement. You had a three and a half percent move in 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 the Nasdaq, I believe, right, and maybe a one and a half percent move in some of the other indices. But you didn't have volatility expand into that move down either. So it was kind of a little bit of a of a unusual, not normal volatility versus market move uh, week. Uh, and I don't read anything into it, but volatility depressed again today, down 30 cents. And a lot I mean, of news, like and a lot of news to, to, to disseminate, too. Yes, and it feels like we're moving back into that 2016, 17, 18 kind of world where you have this just wall of geopolitical event risk and people spill a lot of ink talking about it, discussing it, telling you what you should feel, what you should think, what you should fear. And the markets just continue to trudge higher. I think this weekend was a really interesting litmus test for people, particularly in markets, who purport themselves to be traders versus, how should I say, um, financial luminaries who like to speak a lot. I've seen a lot of takes out there from people saying, oh, this Russia thing means X, Y, Z. This is how you trade it. This is how you invest around it. I think that's a pretty, a pretty short-sighted view. I think those people are saying those kind of things for clicks. Because first off, we in the West have a completely different conception of how global affairs should be run. I read this book a few years ago called The New Czar. Uh, I think his name, the author's name was Stephen Lee Myers. And it was about Vladimir Putin's upbringing in St. Petersburg and how he amassed power through his time through the KGB and then the FSB, ultimately how he ended up replacing Boris Yeltsin. It's pretty clear to me that we have no clue what's going on. I consider myself a well-read person geopolitically. I've lived in different parts of Europe for a number of years. I've studied abroad. I would be the first person to tell you I have no clue what's happening in Russia. But what I can tell you is that if something is happening that matters to markets, it's going to appear on uh, in a few asset classes first and foremost. And I think we can just go back to what happened at the beginning of last year. What happened with wheat prices? What happened with fertilizer prices? Companies like Nutri and NTR and Mosaic, MOS, they did really, really well because Russia is a big exporter of potash. You need that for fertilizer. Fertilizer prices haven't gone anywhere the last few days. Wheat prices haven't really gone anywhere the last few days. You're not seeing natural gas prices or oil prices go ballistic. Actually, what, so wheat, for, wheat prices, I mean, today are down significantly. In the last two or three days have been down significantly now they rallied into this coup prior to the coup being you know disseminated i i don't think i think it's pretty random when i look at it that way go ahead i'm sorry was it a coup i i, mean, I don't think it was a coup. The coup news i mean i don't know like you i have no idea either only one of us in this room has gone to russia uh so it could really you know weigh in on this First i've never all, been i i think that russia has been a dead play from a trading perspective, there is no play in Russia. There hasn't been a play in Russia. We there, tried with, what was it, RSX, yeah, remember? There back most likely will never be another play in Russia other than, you know, Russia doing, other than Putin's last gasp, whatever that may be, you know, um, maybe that creates some kind of an international stir for whatever reason. But Russia is dead man walking. And it, when you say you have no clue what's going on in Russia, neither do Russians. So, like, if you were to speak to there's a there's a there's a group of, you know, I talk almost daily to to a lot of people in 
in and around. They're, they're all Russian, but they don't live in Russia anymore. But all their assets are in Russia. And so they have a much, they're much closer to the fire than you or I are, meaning that, you know, they've left Russia because for many reasons, they don't want to be involved. They, they can't run businesses out of Russia. It's toxic. They don't want to be involved. They don't want their kids drafted, whatever the reason is. And there's a gazillion reasons to leave Russia. Um, if you're smart, if you're an engineer, whatever it is. But the problem is you can't get your money out and you can't get your assets out or anything like that. So you're completely still tied to Mother Russia. And not one of them has a clue as to what's going on. And at this point, I don't think one of them really cares other than hopefully someday things will normalize and they'll be able to go home and get their stuff and maybe, you know, maybe keep some of their stuff. I mean, they don't know. But, but the idea that there's a tradable, something tradable around this, it just, it's not there. There's nothing. I mean, we can look at, you, know, you can't make an argument for gold or, or, or silver or crude oil or wheat or anything else or any commodity or any equity for that matter. The equity market, Russia's, Russia has buried themselves as far as, I mean, we, everybody, we didn't underestimate Putin. We grossly overestimated Putin. For, for a variety of reasons, because you have we had really dumb people running this country who overestimated Putin. And we had just an incredible amount of people globally that that um, that overestimated Putin. And really, you know, he's he's completely useless and dumb, incredibly dumb and 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 has mismanaged this process and has basically destroyed the country. I don't I don't know how they're going to recover. I think it's going to take. 10 to 20 years, at least at least two decades for Russia to recover. And I don't think there's a play there, Chris. I just, I can't, I mean, I understand the size and I understand the, the, the various commodities that they have, but I just don't think there's a play. I don't know how anybody, you know, I don't know how anybody trades it. Uh, the size, it's, it's, its economy is basically the size of Italy's. Uh, it's Europe's gas station run by yeah. a mafia that has nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's your. That's, I mean, that's, that's like the that's nicest well thing you could say about them. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, I don't think Russia ever recovers. I think they yeah. become a steward of China. What choice do they have, right? If they're going to grow economically, they have to tether themselves to some section of the world that has some capacity for production. Uh, and ultimately, China needs a lot of raw materials to keep its economy growing. So maybe Russia can find a partner there. But even then, Russia moves most of its shipments via rail. It, it's not like they're trucking this stuff over to Europe. It's, it's rail and it's pipelines. Those things take time to lay. Well, Russia has a service it, business. Russia has... Russia has a an educational infrastructure that actually works, and for and now, they're, for now, they're going to have to rebuild it because they've lost their their intellectual. The the elite has essentially disappeared, and um, it's only the crap that has remained. And so, you know, they're they're they've lost essentially their their entire tax base. They've lost all their multinational corporations. They've lost a hundred percent of investment. I mean, there's there's you know, it's going to take a, a new leadership re regime. It's going to take a complete rebuild, and not the way you're going to have to rebuild Ukraine, but the way you're going to have to rebuild Russia is going to be just as as expensive, and it's also going to take many many years for firms to have the confidence to move any of their revenue source, any of their any, anything that drives revenue back into Russia. I mean, the, the way they've dismantled, you know, the, the, the country is just it's incredible. Now, they have the size, they have the physical size and um, uh, I, that I think that eventually they will recover. But, you know, I mean, I mean, when you said coup before, who cares? I mean, you know, Putin, he deserves to die. I mean, you know, who cares? I don't know why anybody, you know, I don't even, I, I, great. Yeah, but didn't, I mean, didn't Muammar Gaddafi, didn't Castro, didn't they all deserve that? And didn't they last way too long? I mean. Yeah, they all last. That's, this that's could go what, on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a version I mean, of a dictatorship, but yeah, sure. Well, well speaking of Gaddafi, I, I want to bring that up because people have been saying, what will be the implications for oil here if something happens with Russia and there's a coup? If you look back historically, when there are disruptions or oil shocks in the market, it's usually because of a domestic strife that ultimately hinders domestic production. You think about what happened with Venezuela in the 2000s, for example. Uh, you think about the, the issues with the start of the war, people thinking that some of the 
uh, actual facilities and pipelines in Eastern Europe would be damaged or destroyed because of the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Russia's domestic oil production is probably not going to be threatened by whatever turmoil there is or isn't. And quite frankly, if I'm going to stake out a position on this issue, I'll say that this is probably laying the groundwork for Putin's 2024 re-election campaign. That was the purpose of this, nothing more. Uh, you know, you, you look at someone like Prigozhin, and he's a hot dog vendor from St. Petersburg, <laughs> who is part of that St. Petersburg gang of people in Putin's orbit. You guys like uh, Shogu and, and Gerasimov, they are part of the Moscow group of individuals. There is a clear tension within the Russia political elite, the St. Petersburg versus the Moscow folks. So for me, this is an effort to make the Moscow folks look stupid so that Putin looks like he needs more power, more authority. He can fix the war. It's been the army generals, these uh, liberal elites in Russia that have been causing the problems. Otherwise, their manly, burly military would have trounced Ukraine and marched on Kiev in three days. So, yeah, if I, there is I, don't a, think, if I don't think there's a single person in Russia that believes that at this point. <laughs> they, they, well, but as a culture, they've decided to bury their heads, which is sad. You know, and, and but that's perception matters more than reality, yeah. right? So, if I'm watching anything in the oil markets right now, I think about this Wagner private military contract, the Wagner PMC group, they have, you know, we talk about Goldman being the, the squid that's wrapped around the globe with its financial affairs. Wagner's really more like that squid or octopus. It has its tentacles all over Africa, all over the Middle East. In particular, it's been helping prop up the rebel government in Libya, uh, the LNA. The internationally recognized GNA is based in Tripoli. But the LNA controls a lot of the eastern part of the country where these oil fields are. Libya exports a million barrels per day. So if this Wagner PMC group is going to collapse, you could see knock-on effects in some of these commodity exporting countries like a Libya, like a Mali, like a Sudan. And that's where you could see disruption for the market. But this, this notion that people are keeping their eyes focused on Eastern Europe for a disruption to global energy supply chains, I think is misplaced. It's not Russia we should necessarily be concerned about, but how does Wagner collapse in the broader world? And that's not really something we can trade. We're not going to get that information up front. It's only going to be known after the fact, which is why I think anyone placing any trades around this, you are throwing darts at a dartboard, my friend. There is, there is really nothing to be had here. I know there may be some convexity in these bets, but if this was a big deal, gold would have behaved differently, nat gas, exactly. potash, mosaic, right? The market is clearly telling us this is a good story. It's another brick in our wall of worry for us to climb this summer. Because guess what, folks? July has been the best month of the year for stocks. Nine of the past 10 years, it's gone up. It's been the best month over the past five and 10 years. The Fed can't derail it. The U.S. default can't derail it. There's no U.S. recession coming, at least this year, it looks like. Now, Russia, it's another good story to talk about around, say, a cup of uh, polonium tea. Polonium tea. Like it, um, yeah. I that's that's you know the the whole thing with Russia and, and the reason it sometimes it always interests me to, to just to read the stories is it's a it's 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 a good read. I just don't think it's a trade, you know. And and I'm sad about that because I really thought there was some you know there was some interesting there was some interesting plays. And in fact, when the when the um, when all the conflicts started to happen. You know, we, we got caught long some RSX. There was a couple of Russian companies that I thought got crazy cheap. They were really interesting to me. And, you know, just the way it all imploded is just, it's ugly. I don't think RSX has traded since last March, right? No, no, and no, 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 no. They've just, they've, they've, um, I, yeah, it hasn't. I, I, I mean, it looks they, like they had one day where it traded, I think but I they don't dissolved think so. the fund. Uh, I'm pretty sure they dissolved the fund. Um, at least my p l shows that they've dissolved the fund yeah yeah like 560 <laughs> um, or something like that yeah right? no 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 like oh, zero. zero last yeah. trade was 560 oh. no no solid. last trade was 560 but i mean where they marked it down to zero. Oh, they did i didn't um know. because i didn't yeah. have it so i don't know what they ultimately did they discern at some point they did, i think they determined that the assets were um wouldn't cover the expenses of maintaining the fund right so um so but anyway you know it's just it's it's just incredible to to believe what's going on there. You know, like I'll, I'll tell a story that I think that we've told before, but I don't know, we didn't make a big deal about it, but years ago, in 2006, we tried to buy um, a dev firm that we work with in Russia. And so I went to St. Petersburg, we, we hired a bunch of attorneys in St. Petersburg, but they were all New York law firms, you know, big, big multinational, international law firms. 
based out of New York and London, place like that. And the other side in Russia hired the same, you know, just a different law firm, but same type of big multi, you know, national law firms. And we sat down at a table for three days to try to make an acquisition of a Russian dev firm that was doing work for us and, and we wanted to own them. After three days, we called off the whole thing with, with both of us being friends. I mean, you know, the, the prior C relationships. Yeah, the CEO of that firm and, and myself, we're, we're still close friends, but we couldn't make the acquisition. We couldn't acquire them because we simply couldn't get through Russian business law to, to, to show that what we actually owned. <laughs> like, there was just no way to get the deal done. So, but what blows my mind about the whole thing is if we had done the deal, I kind of feel like now, even though the firm has been a very successful firm and it would have been a successful deal for us, that that firm would have been, it would have been worth zero. You know, like it. But it would have been worth nothing. Yeah. We'd have had to hand over the keys to the Russian government, right? The yeah. sanctions totally undercut that. You, yeah. you see McDonald's basically give up all their storefronts and we've seen some cheeky photos online of what the new Russian McDonald's yeah, look but, like. But the crazy thing is like we we were we were sitting there and that was a risk that never even occurred to us. Like it legit never occurred to us. Like that was that was a risk that we just didn't put in. Like I never saw this going backwards to that extent. It was a risk we just we just couldn't put into our model. Like we had a lot well, of I risks. Mean, that was not one of them. It's a risk, I think, that some companies are starting to think about with respect to China as well. I mean, who's to say that China, which has been really aggressive with, we can literally call it IP sharing, if we want to be nice about the term, I consider it IP theft. Yeah. But the Chinese government is is very draconian in how it runs its economy yeah. with respect to foreigners. Yeah. And so if there's a situation with Taiwan, who's to say that they won't seize a Foxconn production plant, right? And you see now Apple is starting to try to move some of its business out to India, where you have a large population, maybe not as educated uh, as the Chinese at this point in time. They will catch up. But there's less of that risk there, where all of a sudden you wake up one day and find out, oh, you know, this is now an asset we have to write down to zero. And oh, by the way, we're not going to have any supplies to ship out for the holiday season. Yeah, but the crazy thing is, you drive from the airport, like just as an example, and you pass by Google, Microsoft, you know, Apple, um, you pass by these huge firms like JetBrains and all these major tech hubs, you know, and you're way into downtown St. Petersburg and you're thinking to yourself, how could this ever, like, who's gonna blow this? Like, who's gonna destroy this? You golden got this, egg, golden goose kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, like how, how are you that dumb? And like I said, everybody overestimated they, this, this Putin. He's an idiot. He's a complete idiot. It's just amazing. Oh, this, this is why I say I think that we have a different worldview and a different understanding of how affairs should be handled geopolitically. Putin himself has a penchant for hating the West because he thinks the collapse of the USSR was one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. And Unfortunately, I can't rationalize that. I can't even understand that perspective. But if that's what you believe in, right, it's almost like a religious zealot. It's dogmatic. It doesn't okay. need to make sense to us. Yeah, you're right. Good stuff, Chris. Awesome, my man. Let's take a quick 90-second break. Even the S&P is up 15. Uh, you mentioned oil is down 95 cents to 68.43. We'll be back in 90 seconds. We got a market measure next. Thanks, Chris.